welcome Professor Lee. If you don't mind, I think I'll start by taking off my jacket. Don't worry, that's all I'll take. Uh, <laughs> I have the daunting task, I guess. First of all, thank you for that generous introduction. Uh, it's a delight to be here. I just love my little friend from Hunch Holligan and several others of you. But I said I have a daunting task. I have this book, yeah, just out. And uh, of course, it's full of my my head is, is brimming with what's in it, and how to offer it to you in less than an hour will be hard. How much time do we have, by the way? From 12.25 until when? About one hour. About one hour, I see. And I want to have a hyper discussion. So I can't promise to get through it all. It's really three parts, rhythm, metaphor, and politics, and it's a project that developed uh, over a long time. I started taking random notes on these things in the 1970s and 80s, really, and I had five and I had the rhythm, the things I noticed about rhythm in the Chinese language, and then a few years ago I thought, gee, I have to write this up, and it came out as this three-part book. Um, so we'll go one by one, and I can't promise to get through all the way to the politics part. If you like the politics part, come this afternoon. I'll have more to say about politics. <laughs> Um, rhythm. Uh, I'll start with how I got interested in it. In 1988, I went to Beijing to work as a bureaucrat for the National Academy of Sciences on scholarly exchange. And I noticed this sign in front of the Yui Bingguan, where I lived, to cross the street said, Yi kan er man, san gu guo. Take your time, one the first look, and then go slowly, and then cross the street. But what I noticed was it's rhythm. Yi kan er man, san gu guo. Not only rhythm, but qi and rhythm, the kind of thing that we scholars of Chinese poetry are familiar with, where you have one, two, one, two, one, two, three patterns. But here it was on a sign telling people how to cross the street. And across the top of the street was a, a banner was stretched that said, Go, go, xing, xing, chu, chang, zao, an, an, xuan, xuan, hui, jia, lai. Uh, be happy in going out of the city and be safe in coming back to your home. But again, in qi and rhythm. Across the street, and there's a sign outside the toilet that says, Ginger sweet, <laughs> don't just relieve yourself wherever you want, but in Chia, in this Chia rhythm. Uh, so I started to li listen for rhythms in daily life. You get on a bus going into town, and the uh, the show show yuan said, Xia yi zhan, long ke yuan, mei piao lai piao, which certainly has a rhythm. <laughs> not qian, not wu yan. But then I realized that's the same rhythm that I use in the United States when I tell my phone number 609 258 4776. So, oh, is there something going on with the human brain here that prefers that kind of clustering of syllables? Uh, I don't know. Well, that's the kind of reflection that got me interested in this topic. And what I want to present to you today are four theses about it. I don't have PowerPoint, but here are the theses. <clears throat> One, the Chinese uses this kind of rhythmical pattern a lot, probably more than most other human languages, certainly more than English. Uh, number two, that these rhythmical, rhythmical patterns of Chinese have deep cultural roots, as well as universal commonalities with other languages. Proposition three, that uh, in the broadest sense of what we mean by mean, and of course philosophers can hold whole, whole courses on this topic, and we don't have time for that, but I think that rhythms contribute to meaning. And then fourth, that the people who use rhythmic patterns and who take in their meanings aren't necessarily aware that they're doing so. Now, there's something paradoxical there about meaning is something we usually understand as something that you do on purpose, but my discovery, I think, here is that sometimes <coughs> meanings go back and forth, even though speaker didn't 
consciously intend them, nor did the listener consciously interpret them. Okay, one by one. Chinese uses rhythmical patterns more than other languages. I used to teach at Princeton, and when I got on the train there, the uh, conductor would say, ticket, ticket, which certainly has a rhythm. Uh, but if that conductor were to say, as the short Piaoyuan in, in Beijing said, next stop is New Brunswick, get your ticks quick. That would be roughly the same, but that would scare everybody off the train. That would be out of place in American English. Or you get to New York City and you see a sign that says, be careful crossing the street, okay? But if the sign were in rhythm, uh, New Yorkers would flip out. They would think, that, that, that's, that's weird, what are you doing? Uh, I started to notice graffiti, uh, I'm sorry, these rhythms all over the place in Chinese society, not just in political language or formal signs, but informal graffiti scrawled onto uh, walls at, at, at uh, scenic spots and uh, on t-shirts, the so-called cultural t-shirts. One says, a volunteer security patrolman, a sarcastic political comment, but written in Qian, in advertising. A poster advertising English lessons as Yin Yu Xue Xi Xin Tu Hua Qian, or a uh, medicine that kills cockroaches. Gang Lang Si Wang Wang Xi Wu Yan. So, I'm not going to go into more detail. In the book, there are pages and pages and pages of these Puyen and Qian that are drawn from all over the range of modern Chinese usage. Uh, the second proposition I put before you is that the rhythmic patterns have deep cultural roots as well as commonalities. Uh, certainly Qian and Muyen in classical poetry and folk songs uh, are easy to find. I have a friend who teaches uh, philosophy in Hong Kong, Hong Shen Li, who has a book about this kind of thing. And he has devised two very clever ways to test whether Wu Yan and Qi Yan patterns come out from strings of syllables that otherwise have no structure. And his two examples are what he calls item lists, things like kitchen supplies in Chinese. We say, uh, kindling, rice, oil, salt, soy sauce, vinegar, and tea, okay? But there's seven of them. And when they're said, they're said, if you say them in different rhythms, it doesn't sound quite right. And someone might come along and say, where's garlic? What kitchen of Chinese doesn't have garlic? You need eight but If you put in sun, it makes it eight, and the rhythm breaks down, and it doesn't work, and it doesn't be so. This is one way he convincingly, to my mind, shows that qi in that two, two, three pattern is a cultural artifact. The other way one he uses, and I won't take time for examples, are transliterations. For example, Albania is Arbania, Arbania. And it's usually said with a slight break after the otter, because that's the way the pattern has it. Uh, but, well, if you look at, at, at English and something like a limerick that's got a lilt, of course, um, that too, I don't think anyone would argue is an invention. Uh, Xu Zhu Wa at one point tried to use a limerick pattern and stick in Chinese language, and it was an interesting experiment, but it just didn't work. Uh, so there are cultural uh, tendencies in foreign rhythms, but there are also commonalities. And I go in the book in certain detail about this. Uh, musicologists have postulated, for example, that 4-4 four, four time one, two, one, two, one, two, is because human beings have two legs. And therefore, in Chinese and in English, there is a tendency, as one gets more and more popular in one's forms, to use 4-4 four, four time. Uh, 
Chaucer and Shakespeare have five feet meter. But ditties and hymns and other popular forms in Western languages tend to go to 4-4. Four, four. Hymns, you know, and uh, it's postulated that that's because of the two-leggedness of human beings. One might ask whether insects naturally have that kind of tendency or not. Uh, but in Chinese, you can certainly find the same kind of uh, tendency. Uh, you take a qian phrase like in Shandong Fast Tales that say, that's qian. But when it's performed, it resolves into 4-4 four, four time again. So, is there a commonality there? Is it related to the fact that human beings have two legs? I don't know. But certainly there's a commonality. And the generalization that the less elite you get, the more the tendency towards 4-4 four, four time, I think, is defensible. Uh, there's a puzzle here, and I have a section in the book about it. Some rhythms that are more complicated than just 4-4 four, four time also tend to be universally bound. Uh, I start with an example from basketball cheerleaders at Nankai University in the 1940s. I wasn't there then. This is from a friend of mine, a former <laughs> teacher who was, who said that the cheerleaders said, Okay. But the pattern there is one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. <clears throat> and a lot of more contemporary phrases use it. There's a riddle about uh, peanuts. Ma wu zi hong zhang zi li ber zhu zhu ba bai pang zi. It's one, two, three, 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 seven. The great Maoist hymn, The East is Red, uses it. Dong fang hong, tai yang sheng, dong wo chu le ge ma zi. Never mind that le ge, that's a syncopated beat that gets thrown in. The basic pattern is three, three, seven. So I asked a friend who does classical poetry, and she said, I'm sure from the fourth century, we've got Tian Cang Cang, Ye Mang Mang, Feng Tui Cao Di Xian Yong Yang. So you have the three, three, seven in ancient Chinese thought, too. Now, why is this a puzzle? It's a puzzle because the West uses it, too. Uh, in modern Chinese nursery rhymes, we have Ni Pai Yi, Wo Pai Yi, Yi Ge Xiao Har Kai Bei Ji, Ni Pai Er, Pai Er, and so on. Three, three, seven. But we also, in English, have this old man, he plays one. <laughs> essentially the same. So, was this borrowed? My first impulse when I ran across the nursery line was that the Chinese must have been borrowed from the West as Zhu Mi Shang Zhu Kuai Lo is borrowed and others. Uh, but no, it can't possibly be borrowed from the West because it's so ancient in China. So, did the West borrow it from China? <laughs> equally hard to prove as a Japanese scholar, and you can read the details in the book, who theorizes that it originated in the ancient Near East and spread separately towards across the Silk Road to China and north to uh, Europe in the other direction. And these are mysteries, but the commonality is there. And whether that's a cultural spreading or an innate tendency of the human brain to want to latch on to certain patterns is sort of a puzzle for me. I'm going to go to my third proposition here, that in the broadest sense of what we mean by mean, these rhythms contribute to mean. Now, I don't mean that rhythms have just functions in a broader sense, which is fairly uh, uncontroversial as a proposition. When we do marches, we use rhythms and sort of so that everybody is in step. Uh, the coxswain on a crew uses a rhythm in order to get everybody to row at the same time and win the race. Uh, rhythm clearly is important in maintaining the consistency of transmission of poetry. Uh, nursery rhymes, for example. Why do they stay the same through ages and across cultures? Well, the rhythm, I think, 
helps to lock it in and keep people keeping them identical because you need that next syllable because the rhythm demands it. And even things like remembering. Here I'll go back to the telephone number example. My telephone number in now in California is 951-780-8030. Any of you can call me up. But <laughs> I can only say that in that rhythm. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, four. If I tried to say it as 95-178-0803-0, I can do that because I've written it down. And I'm reading it to you, written down. I couldn't do that closing my eyes, and I bet you couldn't either. Try to say your phone number in a weird rhythm. You can't. So memory has to do, I mean, rhythm has to do with the effectiveness of memory. But I don't mean any of that by meaning. What I mean by meaning here is contributing some sense from speaker to listener of content, of something that's communicated. Uh, I mentioned this to a colleague at Princeton in the English department who does poetry, and he said, of course, of course rhythms have meanings. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, like a limerick. A limerick um, is intrinsically whimsy in its rhythm, not just in the words. Of course, the words are usually whimsical, but the rhythm itself has become whimsical. And I tested this by making up this example. If you take Macbeth's famous soliloquy about is this a dagger which I see before me and I held it toward my hand? Okay. And put it into limerick form. You could get something like this. <clears throat> that dagger just hung in the air where it gave to Macbeth a great scare. What specter can such be? Come, let me clutch thee. To hang there like that isn't fair. <laughs> and you chuckle. At least some of you did. There's something funny about it. Because the austerity of the meaning of the, of, the, of the words doesn't match the whimsicality of the limerick. The limerick, just the rhythm, wants you to be lighthearted and whimsical, whereas the material is so austere and that doesn't match. And that incongruity is funny. That's pretty good proof to me that my friend at Princeton was right, that the rhythm itself has a meaning. So and then I ask, is that true of Chinese rhythms? Uh, let's compare Yi Kan, Er Man, San Hong Guo, or Crossing the Street in Beijing, with what the crossing guard might have said orally, which is that kind of same meaning, but what's different? There's something more, what word should we use? Formal, authoritative, exalted about the meaning, the, the, about because of the rhythm. You think of a phrase like Guilin Shan Shui Jia Tian Xia. The scenery in Guilin cannot be beat. Of course, that's probably true. But there's Yellowstone Park, there's Yosemite, there's other. I mean, objectively speaking, it's not quite right to say that Guilin is absolutely number one. And yet, this phrase is convincing. Why? Because the rhythm, I think helps exalt it to a level where, don't question, end of story. Because of the rhythm, I think. All right, my proposition four is that about these meanings, often they are used by both speaker and listener inadvertently. One of my examples here is the opening line of Lu Xun's famous story, Kong Yi Qi, which if you've read the story, you might even remember. It says, Lu Zhen Jiu Dian Da Ge Jiu Shi Ge Bie Chuo Bu Tong Yi Beautiful sentence, lovely sentence. Mellifluous sets the scene, everything's right. It's actually Qi, Lu Zhen Jiu Dian Da Ge Jiu now, did Lu Xun consciously think, I'm going to use Qian because that's going to really set the scene well? Do readers think, oh, Qian, that's great? I did it when I read it. I thought, that's great, but I didn't think, Qian, that's great. That's an example, I think, of the rhythms making a difference, Qi Zhuo, even though speaker and 
and listener aren't aware that they're doing that. My favorite example of this inadvertency is from the Cultural Revolution. Maltodong, Maltodong exhorted the Chinese people to destroy the four olds. Old customs, old habits, old this, old that, get rid of them. Well, certainly old rhythms would be part of the old, right? And yet, when the Red Guards go to Tiananmen, they say, Right? Uh, and then you start to look in the cultural revolution language, and the qian is all over the place. And then yan examples equally pervasive. And so, so the puzzle is there. Did Mazadong and the Red Guards <laughs> notice? I mean, here they're using the four olds to praise the man who's exhorting them not to use the four olds. I don't think either side realized it. And yet, did something get communicated? Was it more exalted, more formal, more something to use the rhythm than not to use it? Certainly as well. I have examples from earlier times from Bu Shi, uh, who Chen uh, Dongxiao, uh, who <coughs> exhibit the same irony uh, of not being aware of violating their own rules. Bu Shi, as you may know, in the late teens, said uh, he had his Ba Bu Zhui for good writing. Don't do these eight things. One of which was Bu Jiang Dui Zha. Don't do parallelism. And yet. When he advocated science, he said, Da dan de jia chu, xiao xin li qiu zhe, is the secret to science. Which is not only wu yan, but it's got this antithetical parallelism. Da dan de, big gold da, and then xiao xin the little heart da. Uh, parallel as well as rhythmical, uh, in explicit violation of his advice to bu jiang li zhe. And yet he did. Why? Well, it felt good, it felt right, it worked, the listeners understood it. Mm. I have a little section on whether rhythms go through fashions. Uh, for example, I think, and I, I've looked in the newspapers to try to prove it, that four character, four syllable per line rhythms were more common during the Great Leap Forward. Are all greatly forward slogans. I think you can say that, well, we do this all the time in all kinds of jargons, including Western academic jargon. We go through you know, fads of such and such a word or is, is, is sexy at the time. And I think this applies to rhythms in Chinese language. Uh, now, I'm not going to take more time to go into the big topic of why I think Chinese. Uh, does have more rhythm. We normally we think of African cultures and Caribbean cultures as the ones that have got rhythm. And yet in daily life language, I think there's no question in my mind now that there are more of these rhythms. And that calls for explanation. And I think it has to do with the way morphemes work in Chinese. The Chinese has been called a monosyllabic syllabic language, which is false, of course. Any respectable linguist knows that words in Chinese can be multi-syllables and stuff. Di Guo Zhui is four syllables, and then one word. But still, there is a convenient fungibility of morphemes in Chinese that allows one to put a thought into exactly seven syllables more easily than in Western languages. There's no question about that, I think. And that's my bottom line explanation for why uh, rhythms can be generated more easily in Chinese. Now I'm finished with the rhythm part and I've already used 20 minutes. Do you want to ask questions about the rhythm part now? Or do you want me to jump into metaphors now and hold questions for later? Can I just ask you just very few, the very few questions I think okay. they, are, they are fascinating. Talking about the rhythm, you know, in Chinese, yeah, you mentioned we have that, and in English, we also have that. For example, you know, English language basically is uh, identical, right? Like, uh, like a key. 
go and catch a falling star is at every potential in the nonsense variety like see you later elevator. Right? Yeah, yeah. So we all we all have that. I think you mentioned about the commonality, I, absolutely that's true. But another point is that contribute to meaning and uh, yeah. that I find it <laughs> I don't know, I really because yeah. I in the early years we all study, you know, the structuralism and saucer and right. so basically we think it's really right. the system of language is the right. in French is long, not but day that create generalized yeah. meaning. So yeah. That can be very soft philosophical. I just don't know how you think about that. No, I, I agree with you. The, the meaning part of my hypothesis here is the fuzziest part, and that it's the hardest to articulate. But I'm not going to back away from it because I really think there is a difference between saying Li Xiaxian的过节 and Yi Kan Herman San Tong Huo. And to use a Western language example, which you invite me to do, and correct me, to illustrate meaning, how about this one? We have in English, I don't know if you've noticed this, but you will probably now. Da, 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 What does that rhythm mean in English? For example, I go to the mall in downtown Atlanta and it's raining and I've had a bad day. I couldn't find my car and then it was locked and I didn't know where my umbrella was <laughs> and I got da, da, da. When you say that kind of rhythm in English, the rhythm itself tells you, I think, a number of things. One is that I'm giving you a list of things. You would never just say, ta 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 ta, and stop. It's always a number of things that happen. Number two, the list is indefinitely long. Ta 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 ta, ta 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 ta, and who knows where it's going to end. Right? And third, usually, but not always, it's an irritating list. <laughs> you use this for things that are annoying you more than you do for uh, happy things. So I would offer you that example as an example where even in English, the rhythm itself means something. We think about it later, though. Yeah. I just have one quick question. Um, even if the people doing the revolution were like clearly aware that they were using older rhythms, do you really think that? they would even make an attempt to change it because they were trying to change ideas and like philosophies, but I feel like trying to change a rhythm you're using in your daily language would be akin to trying to change your accent. Like, right. we should use a different accent. Right. Right. So no. No, your question is, would they have tried to change it? I think yes, because as soon as you make it explicit that you're using one of the four olds, you could be strung up for using one of the four olds, whether inadvertently or not. There's lots of stories from the Cultural Revolution of people who inadvertently used a photograph of Mao Zedong to wrap fish and then got, got, got tortured for that, right? So would they have tried to, to avoid it? I think certainly yes. But could they have, which is the other part of your question? I think you're right. No, it's, this is part of my feeling that these things are so much part of the language and culture that they do go by inadvertently and you could try to change them and want to change them and still not be able to change them. Yeah. I think the fact you mentioned, I think it's correct, the fact, in my view, you know, the, perhaps it's easier to have this rhythm because the Chinese is a normal say that each, whether it's a free, no film or bound one, and each character has one sound. One syllable. Yeah, one syllable, that's yeah. right. But in English, it's hard to do that. It's right. like Agamemnon, Cleopatra. You know, right. It's more than one, so it makes it hard. Yeah. Right. Right. I'm going to go to the metaphor section with your permission, <coughs> otherwise we won't have time. <coughs> I got onto this topic also yeah. 20 or 30 years ago when I ran across a little book by uh, George Lakoff mm -hmm. and Mark Johnson called Metaphors We Live By. I don't know if we have cognitive scientists in the room. Mm -hmm. um, this was a real eye-opener to me um, because they uh, argue that we get used to in daily life language using metaphors that not only structure the way, or reflect the way we think about things, but are powerful enough to determine the way we continue thinking about them. One of their examples is that consciousness is up and unconsciousness is down. And in English, we have examples like wake up and fall asleep, sink into a coma. And that 
up and down for consciousness or not is a strong enough metaphor that when new things come along, like Freud, 19th century with his theory of the other kind of consciousness, it becomes a subconscious. Right? And then even computers, when they come along and appear to be conscious in a sense, and then they go down and they go along. So I think they're right about that. These metaphors do structure thought. But then I start to think, and this was my big inspiration, is it the same for a language as different as Chinese as in English? And if you think of the up and down for consciousness metaphor, it doesn't work in ancient Chinese. Now certainly in modern Chinese it does. We have the Xia Yi Shu, but that's a borrowing from the West, subconscious. If you go back to Zhuangzi and his butterfly, uh, or plenty of pre-modern examples, and even in modern Chinese when you yun uh, you, you, you faint across the chi, and you xing guo lai, you wake back across, not up or down. And I thought about Zhuangzi and the butterfly because that conundrum of am I a human being dreaming that I was a butterfly, or am I a butterfly who was dreaming he was a human being, to me is more puzzling in the consciousness crosses a plane concept than it is in the up and down concept. Um, so I read this book with great care, asking on almost every page, um, where is Chinese the same or different? Um, and got involved with the whole controversy of the so-called sapir Whorf hypothesis that is still controversial today in its details about whether language tends to uh, determine thought or thought determines language. And for the purposes of my book, I, I look at those controversies but set them aside because for my main purposes, it doesn't matter which way causality goes there. What does matter is that there is a correlation between language and the way people think. Uh, so I found some places where Chinese metaphors, conceptual metaphors, are different from uh, English ones, but also found, surprisingly, uh, ones that were the same, in, in surprising ways, surprising to me anyway, uh, and argue that there are two reasons for the universality certain conceptual metaphors and not human beings. Uh, one is the Noam Chomsky or Immanuel Kant kind of approach that says it's part of the structure of the human brain that we have certain grammatical rules or Kant said that certain things are synthetic a priori categories of the pure understanding. That's just the way the brain is. So that um, conceiving uh, time I'm sorry, conceiving space as time, for example, we say a long time in English, in Chinese and stuff. That can be done, but conceiving time using space metaphors, try it. I dare anyone in this room to try it. I tried hard. You can't do it. The human brain won't let you say something parallel to a long time by saying something like an ancient space to mean a small place. It, it just doesn't work. So they're on to something there. I think there's certain things the human brain does and won't do. The other strong grounds for commonality across culture, and here Lakoff and Johnson are strong in this argument, is what they call the physical or the experiential basis for metaphors. For example, in many languages, up means more. There's no there's no conceptual con uh, connection between the concept of up and moreness, but any place in the world, if you make a pile of something, the higher the pile gets, uh, more stuff makes the top of the pile higher, and that, they argue, is the reason why up and more become conceptually related. <clears throat> a similar example is red meaning angry. In English, we get red faced with anger. In Chinese, we get mian hong ar chi shen qi de de liao. Why? Well, Lakoff and Johnson give this as an example. Uh, it's a natural fact of human physiology that when you get anger, angry, blood rushes to the capillaries and makes your face redder than it was before. Of course, 
Capillaries could also mean embarrassment, and we sometimes turn pink in English and so on. Uh, so there are, or man hong in Chinese, right? Or embarrassed. Uh, <clears throat> there are those two bases, the structure of the mind and the physical or experiential basis that leads metaphors across languages and cultures to be uh, common. But I also found an interesting inconsistency in conceptual metaphors and found that those two were common across languages. Uh, space for time is a good example. In English, we look forward to the future. Okay? Forward, the future is forward, but our forefathers are in the past. How do you explain that? <clears throat> our forefathers came before us and therefore can be of no help with the problems that lie before us. Huh? Where are we? They're before us, but the problems are before us, and I find Chinese has the very same ambiguity. We say yi qian to mean in the past, right? But xiang qian kai, look forward toward the future. If you talk about the future of the coming generations in Chinese, we can say hou dai de qian tu. Hold on, doesn't it sound contradictory? In my chapter, I, I tease this out, and in fact, I'll go to it right away. In the, in the chapter, I divide these conceptual metaphors into um, different kinds of categories and deal with them one by one. Um, time, color, up and down, north and south, consciousness, and so on. And in the time section, uh, figure out, I think, uh, with the help of other scholars, I'm not the first one to have worked on this, um, why um, those time metaphors seem to be contradictory and what they basically are uh, in both Chinese and English. And this is one of the commonalities that surprised me. There's a similarity. Uh, there, there, there are four basic ways that space is used for a time metaphor. Um, one is that. Uh, it's as if a train of events is coming out of the future going towards us and then going back. So that in Chinese we say, hou uh, dai means the ones that are farther back on the train than the front of the train. Uh, and in English we have that same kind of metaphor when we talk about our forefathers. The second case is where we are looking toward the future and striding toward it. Chinese and English both have that. Case three is where time starts high and goes down low. This is very common in Chinese. We say shuo xia qi or xia li bai, xia xin qi, and so on. In English, we don't use it nearly as much, but we do when we, we say um, descendants from our ancestors or hand-me-downs of clothing in the family where farther into the future means down. And then the case four that I analyze is that any of these first three can be mixed with no problem for na native speakers. People don't get confused in Chinese when you say which mixes the metaphors. Shagalibai is the top to bottom metaphor. is the train of events going past you the metaphor. They fit in the same phrase and nobody freaks out about that. When I originally got onto this topic, I was hoping that I would be able to study English conceptual metaphors and Chinese conceptual metaphors and figure out different worldviews. That essentially didn't work because so many are in common. And so many are ad hoc. You can, it's as if you pull out different conceptual metaphors and use them together. And the fact that they contradict at a logical level doesn't matter as long as it gets you through daily life, which it does for people in both cultures. Uh, I have a section on color metaphors. It's obvious, I think, that uh, different color, different languages have different uh, metaphors. Here in English, we have the blues or, or green with envy or somebody's a yellow-bellied coward. Uh, and those are clearly culture bad. Uh, but sometimes they're not if they share a common 
experiential basis. For example, we say green in English for someone who's a neophyte of something. And in Chinese, Qingyan uh, and Qingchun have that same kind of um, new sprouting grass might be the conceptual basis here for connecting green and young. I ran into a problem because sometimes the colors themselves in the two languages don't refer to the same span on the spectrum. In Chinese, for example, huang goes all the way from what we call yellow, your shirt, through this napkin, through the tabletop, is all huang. You know, the yellow river isn't yellow, isn't that? It's brown, right? So huang goes all the way from yellow to tan to brown. <laughs> Qing can mean green or blue or even black. Uh, so, do the languages divide the color spectrum arbitrarily? And I believed that for a long time until I read in the cognitive science field there's good experiments that have been done since the 1970s to show that across languages, and here you get the commonality part, across languages there's a tendency to identify the the, the most appropriate example of the various shades. Uh, two cognitive science, Brent Berlin and Paul Kay wrote a famous article about this, where in French, rouge, in English, red, and in Japanese, akai. For native speakers of the languages, all tended to refer to the very same shade of red. And that seems a puzzle, except in their speculation, and later it's been more or less confirmed. It has to do with the structure of the human eye, that certain things are, the, the more simpler perceptions do tend to focus on the same. They call these focal reds, focal blues, focal greens, and so on. So that's the same in Chinese as well, too. But then the range of ways in which colors are used for metaphors is too big a topic for this book or any book. You have to write an encyclopedia and cover them. I have a section on up and down. We've just seen up and down for past and future, up and down for more and less. Up or down can be bad or good. We say in English, things are looking up. In Chinese, we say, shang te and xia te for a good method or a bad method. Up and down can mean noble and base, high minded or gao shang, or gao ming in Chinese, or low in English, low down, and in Chinese, xia liu, bei xia. Up and down can also mean happy and sad. Uh, our spirits rose in English, gao xing in Chinese, and down or depressed is di luo in Chinese, chen men. Uh, north and south is an interesting example. Uh, in fact, if you want to read a sinologist, want to read an interesting section, I recommend that part of the book. <clears throat> in the modern West, north is up okay, on most maps, and it travels into ordinary society where we say metaphorically uptown, meaning going north of the city, uh, and e even piggybacks on other metaphors so that you can say uh, the men north of 40 aren't doing so well at Wimbledon this year. Actually, I have a quote like that. We're north of 40. He combines north is up with old is up and piggybacks into north of 40. But I looked in with care into this because the oldest map in Western civilization, a stone engraved map in Mesopotamia dating from around 2300 BC, has east at the top edge of the map. And by top, of course, I don't mean up literally. I mean the edge that's away from the viewer, east was up then. And in China, from 300 BC, uh, <coughs> unearthed in Tianshui, in Gansu province, the earliest couple of maps indicated not unambiguously, but pretty clearly, that south is up. And then that south, privileging south, travels into Chinese culture in uh, the invention of the compass, and an uh, ancient Chinese chariot called the Zhernanche, South Pointing Chariot. Um, and into the modern compass, the Zhernanjen, a compass in Chinese you'll know it points south, not points north. And then it travels from 
self as privileged physically to self as privileged morally. We get the poetry of uh, Zhang Han and Li Shangyun showing that Zhernan uh, points to appropriate behavior, morally appropriate behavior, not just to physical direction. So you seem to see in pre-Western influenced Chinese culture a privileging of South and in Western culture of North. And then you get a big puzzle because suddenly in the Northern Song, it flips in China. The maps from the Northern Song have uh, North is up. And you know which way is North because they have a lot of Chinese characters on them and the characters' top sides are on the North side. Uh, so why did that happen? You can read one more book. I try to grapple with that. I'm not sure I've got the right answer. But um, that's North and South. I've got a section on paired dyads, by which I mean words like good and bad, up and down, big and small, true and false, right and wrong, 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 wrong and so on. And what's interesting right off the bat is the Chinese is almost identical to English here. Not from borrowing. It couldn't be possibly from borrowing. Hao huai, shang xia. Da xiao, zhen jia, chang wan. Nobody in Chinese says duan chang or jia chen, and nobody in English says, 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 says wrong and right or short and long. And the privileging of one of those two travels into how they're used in default questions as well. <clears throat> in English, we ask, how tall was the child? Normally, we don't say, how short was the child? Unless. <laughs> Unless the child's shortness was noticed, and you say, well, how short was the child? Then you'd say it. But normally, how short was the child? How tall was the child? Uh, and in Chinese, xiao har yu duo gao. Not, hey, xiao har yu duo You don't ask that, right? In English, we can, we can ask, um, how wide is the Mississippi at its narrowest? Where we're interested in the narrowness, but we use how wide is the way we ask it. So there are these privileging of things that, you know, a priori, there's no reason to privilege. Now, there are exceptions. In English, we say the North and South Poles. In Chinese, we say Nan Bei Ji, which may be left over from that ancient privileging of Nan in Chinese. I don't know, but I suspect so. Um, and male and female, of course, uh, all the women in the audience will appreciate that the male are always the privileged ones in these diet, diets, man and woman, he and she, brothers and sisters, husband and wife, and even in proper names, Jack and Jill, Romeo and Juliet, Hansel and Gretel, and so on. There are exceptions, of course, but in Chinese, the same bias is there. And even into more abstract things like Long Feng and Qian Kun and Cai Zi Jia Ren, the male one comes first. Uh, I'm going to skip over uh, other observations on that because of time shortage. I want to do spend a little time on, on this last one about container examples and ontological examples. Uh, Lakoff and Johnson uh, say that in English and other Indo-European languages, and they wrongly, I think, claim that this is more universal, that what they call container examples and ontological metaphors uh, are necessary for ordinary communication. Uh, going so far as to say we couldn't leave, we, yeah, are necessary for even attempting to deal rationally with our experiences. By a container example, they mean things like um, guppies fall into the tropical fish category, where you've got a category that the guppies fall into, whereas in Chinese, you don't have that container metaphor there nearly as much. Kong and shirt takes care of it, and nothing fell into anything else in order for that logical relation to be expressed. In English, we say we take clay and make it into a statue. Whereas in Chinese, we say, yong clay, like so on, the statue, and nothing falls into a container. By ontological metaphors, Lakoff and Johnson cite, for example, inflation as an example. It's a noun. It's a complex thing. Uh, but the metaphor
therefore, is very convenient because in one word, inflation, it lets us think we're talking about something and put it in other sentences. And we say things like, inflation is killing us at the checkout counter. We need to combat inflation and so on, as if it were a thing. One of their examples is, my fear of insects is driving my wife crazy. Where fear of insects becomes a noun, a thing. And I try to put this in Chinese, and I get which doesn't use a container metaphor. Uh, I don't have a fear of insects that's doing something to my wife. Um, isn't as natural in Chinese as just saying something like which doesn't use it. So and long and short of it, I began to suspect that English and Indo-European languages like to use nouns and container metaphors more than Chinese does. And so I tested this. I took a page from uh, Charles Dickens' Oliver Twist at random, and a page from Cao Xuejin's Hong Meng at random, and counted the nouns and verbs on them, and uh, found that on Dickens' page, 96 nouns and 38 verbs appeared, where the nouns outnumbered the verbs about two and a half to one. And in Cao Xuejin's page, 130 nouns and 166 verbs. So that here the verbs slightly outnumbered the nouns. Now, you, you can go back to those pages and argue with me about whether certain things really are verbs or really are nouns, because sometimes it's a bit ambiguous. So I'll, I'll give you give or take 10% on those numbers. But the overall result that natural Chinese uses verbs much more and natural English uses nouns much more, I think was confirmed. And so I started to take this and wonder whether that affects uh, Western wrestling with philosophy. I was an undergraduate major in philosophy and studied things like the good, form, matter, mind, body, beauty, justice, existence, all nouns. And the puzzles in the philosophy courses were, what are those things? And I started to think, but if you think in Chinese, the puzzles don't appear as much because the, they're not things. I took a sentence from um, an anthropologist that I used in the book, Hoyt Alverson, who talks about the ontogeny of time in his conceptual metaphor and reasoning and defines ontogeny as the character of the being of something. So we're talking about the character of the being of time. And I tried to put that into Chinese, and you get, literally, you get which is utterly opaque in Chinese. The only thing a Chinese listener could take from that would be, this must be translated from English. What could it mean to say, in ancient Chinese talk about existence, in fact, we don't use a noun so much as verbs. Yo and wu, well, the ancient Chinese thinkers worried about verbs more. Uh, so, I turned this on a little book by a famous philosopher in Miami named Colin McGinn, maybe you've heard of him, who has a wonderful little book uh, on um, the mind-body problem called The Immoral Flame, is that what it's called? Yeah. And he's got a very sophisticated argument in it, but uh, he gets puzzled in a way that I wish I could tap him on the shoulder and say, try thinking this in Chinese and you might not be so caught up. He writes, I'm quoting McGinn here, we need to make a distinction between the object of awareness and the awareness itself. When I sit in a ski lift, and feel fear about the distance between me and the ground, the object of my fear is a spatial fact, my distance from the earth. It is not that the fear itself is a spatial thing. It, that fear, is not 100 feet long. So he's puzzled about two parallel things, the physical distance and the fear of the physical distance, and he wants to relate them, and that's the mind-body problem for him. He writes, my fear has space as its object, but that which has this object, the mental state of fear itself, is not to be confused with that object. 
So you think this though in Chinese. You put yourself in the chairlift, in the same fear-inducing situation, uh, and you you pop, or you might hey pop, uh, or pop down. Uh, but fear in those in, the, in that those Chinese phrases is a verb, or it's a it's not a noun. Okay, uh, it, and you don't have nearly as easily in Chinese the puzzle of how do I relate this thing with that thing. So. I end this section by asking you know, which, which language and culture here is better off. It's impossible to say. You could say that the Chinese language is deficient because it won't give you the equipment to properly conceive the mind body problem. But if you flip it around, you could say the English language is deficient because it leads you into a problem that there's no reason to have to be in in the first place. Now, I don't think I've solved the mind-body problem, but I think I have shown how, in a different language and culture, it at least is much less of a problem. I'm running out of time, though. I haven't got to the politics part. I pr propose, do we have until 1.30? Is that right? Yeah. I, I, I'll just give you a super capsule of what I write about in the politics part, because I don't have time to go into detail. There I noticed that there's two levels in contemporary Chinese language that I call the official and the unofficial. Of course, there's all kinds of other levels, but for analytical purposes, those two are very different. And in order to do official things and to get through official life, you need to speak at this level and manipulate the language at that level. And it was born originally as an idealistic language about certain people and so on, but then after the, the crash of late Maoism and the cynicism that, that, that came in, it really is just a leftover kind of language game where you play this chess game in order to get what you want. I had a friend at the university in, in Guangzhou where I spent a year who wanted a, uh, a new apartment for his family because they lived in this tiny, cramped little one room with a curtain in between for all four of them, including the children, and the policy came down that we should be better to intellectuals because they were persecuted during the Cultural Revolution. So he goes to his Dawei Shuji to ask for a bigger apartment, but he doesn't say, my apartment's too small, my kids don't have a place to do their homework, can't we have a bigger apartment? No. He goes in and says, <laughs> in order to play a language game, and either gets there or some doesn't because of the success of playing this game. So there are these two levels. So most of the chapter, part of it distinguishes what the two levels are like in terms of vocabulary and grammar and rhythm and metaphor and those things. But also uh, then most of the chapter, most of the